Hi everyone. Um, I'm Vanessa Costanzo and I'm going to admit the discussion. So if you have questions, if you have um, wanted some um, um, details that you would like to know more about, just feel free to ask, don't be shy. And first of all, I will uh, ask all uh, the speakers from uh, this panel to come back on stage before we can ask them questions and I can have a microphone also to answer. So um, since I don't think anyone has a question now, oh yes, great, woo, two. So Mr. Spirat first, maybe from the French Academy of Medicine. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, thank you very much first for this uh, excellent presentation. It's, it's, uh, it, huh? Is it super? Yeah, we're going to hear you. Yeah, it's on. Does it work? Yeah, yes. Is that okay? Okay. Well, I'm going to. Well, I can't. Uh, I just can put it in my mouth. No. <laughs> recognized. 
it is uh, increasingly integrated into the uh, work that we do. The WHO as an organization is not uh, political in that sense. Uh, the, the mandate that we have is to work with our member states to help them, to assist them, to implement uh, evidence-based uh, policies. And as you said, yes, we can recognize areas within member states that need particular work, and that is where we choose to start. And as I, I tried to uh, express in, in my talk previously, when we identify these areas that are of partic uh, particular interest, not only from our side, because we see that there is a gap or a lack, but it's certainly also the member states that have to ask us as an organization for help. Uh, in implementing that. We have to be welcomed into the country. And that is a lot of, uh, of health diplomacy that goes into that. And, and yes, we do recognize that there are differences. Mr. Ryan, do you have anything to add? <coughs> well, I accept to agree completely with what you said, that there are different approaches in different member states. And very often it's the member states with the least number of refugees and migrants who have the <laughs> biggest problem with uh, dealing with them. So, uh, that's a, a bit of a paradox. But I started my introduction this morning by saying that this was a, also a political issue. I also started by saying that health was only one aspect of the problem. So, uh, unfortunately, it's not the health agenda or the health of migrants which leads the discussion. It's, it's very much a subset of the discussion. Now, in terms of ensuring um, the European approach, I think the Commission has been very active from the beginning in proposing solutions. The question is how the member states then take those proposals. And we've seen in the Council of Ministers that the member states have accepted some of our proposals and they have not accepted others. So I would say in general the, uh, the, free, the making available of financial resources has been much easier than the agreement on common principles for repatriation, resettlement between member states. That's why you still have this problem on the Greek islands of 30, 40,000 people living in these camps because the problem of resettlement hasn't been sorted out between the member states. But the European Union is a rules based organization. We work within the framework of the treaty. And where we do have legislation, where member states do not have applied the legislation which they agreed themselves to apply, then we bring them to court. And that's also been the case. We've also brought member states to court. And finally, on the more general European level, there is the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a larger framework where also migrants and refugees have used that treaty and used that court to defend their rights. Now, I'm speaking here uh, from a legal perspective rather than from a human perspective, but there have been a large number of cases in the court in Strasbourg dealing with health, rights to health and rights to social welfare of migrants and refugees. Mr. Ryan, since you have the microphone, just keep it because I have a question for you. Um, and this is a more personal question, but uh, you said migrants uh, have to be considered and they are a catalyzer uh, for the member states. Uh, we know that uh, at the moment for many migrants, uh, the final destination and the goal is uh, the UK. So how will uh, things uh, change uh, when the UK is not going to be part of the European Union anymore. I guess the um, UK had a lot of uh, support from Europe, um, as you said, uh, and as you mentioned during the conference. So how will it be? Um, will Europe, European member states have to support the UK? How will they keep track of these uh, migrant populations? Well, strangely, the country where I live is the country with the largest number of migrants and refugees uh, per head of population. I live in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. It's but not the same kind of population. <laughs> so, so I think there are misconceptions about the United Kingdom and there are misconceptions that it's sort of an El Dorado for undocumented migrants. There are certainly flows towards the United Kingdom, but there are also uh, large populations of refugees in other member states, refugees and migrants in other member states. And we've seen, uh, particularly in Germany, but also in Sweden and in Denmark, the, uh, the, the large numbers of people are moving there. I can't foresee the future. I don't know what the outcome of the process would be in terms of Brexit. Uh, we have a negotiated deal which is uh, awaiting approval by the United Kingdom and also by the European Parliament. So we're in the middle of a process at the moment, and I can't foresee 
of the future regime would be in terms of undocumented migrants crossing the channel. Yeah, but I was talking more about healthcare. Do we uh, will we continue to support healthcare in other countries, uh, like in the UK, for example? No, uh, the, the uh, arrangements for cooperation between the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom in the future are set out in this deal, and the deal has not been approved yet, so therefore we can't speculate on how the healthcare cooperation will be in the future. Okay. Um, anyone has a question? Yes. Okay. Who first? Sorry. Yes, I have uh, two questions. One is about skills and the other is about the economics of migration. Uh, the skills you mentioned that sometimes migrants are actually included in the healthcare system and they try to make use of their skills, which of course is very nice. But my impression is that in general there is very little systematic effort to, uh, when they are, the migrants arrive, to somehow get a sense of what their skills are and then bring them to the place and uh, to the environment where those skills could be used optimally. I mean, there are people who speak French, but they end up in Germany. There are people who have family in Sweden, but they end up in, uh, in Spain. You know, there are people, uh, you know, for whom a job could be found in Belgium, but, uh, you know, they go to, uh, to Poland. So, I mean, it must be possible. I've heard of a program in Holland where on a small scale they just try to do this. Okay, where is there a need for a baker? They would send a baker there from Syria, okay, and this person was very happy. The Holland uh, baker was very happy because he couldn't find staff. So, you know, that's a, almost a perfect match. Why is not more effort being expended to do that? Secondly, about the economics of migration, I have the impression that there's just enormous destruction of value in the whole process. I mean, young people with a whole productive life potential in front of them, you know, perish at sea, uh, people with very little resources, Pooled their money to send one person, you know, to Europe at the cost of you know thousands of euros, whereas if they just could buy a plane ticket, probably could get here on a low-cost airfare for 250. So I mean, it seems like there is a lot of money uh, being paid, but it's ending up in hands of criminal networks, you know, where it's not being to, uh, put to productive use. So isn't there a way to just do this whole process, but in economically more productive and sensible manner? Who wants to answer <laughs> or has anything to add? I can start with a few. Yes. Um, I can start with a few general comments uh, regarding the first part of your question, which is about healthcare workers uh, or workers in general. So, what we focused on is is, is healthcare workers and, and using uh, healthcare workers from countries of origin in their uh, current country of uh, stay. And there are a number of best practices, uh, I agree. We should uh, be better at systematically looking at uh, people that enter a new country in not only assessing their uh, skills and abilities, but certainly also to have a, uh, a long-term vision for how uh, people are able to, to start up work again in order to provide for themselves and their families. Uh, we know that this is important for uh, many of the determinants of health that we discussed earlier. Uh, I would like to mention in Turkey, for example, there is the Syrian Health uh, Worker Project going on where uh, many, many health centers have been uh, set up by the Turkish uh, Ministry of Health in collaboration with the WHO, the IOM, um, where we have Syrian health workers that are integrated into the uh, national healthcare system but provide uh, healthcare specifically to Syrians living in Turkey so that they receive the culturally sensitive uh, healthcare that they, uh, that they require. That's a, a very good and positive example that has uh, really helped with the burden that the uh, Turkish uh, health system has seen with the large arrival of uh, Syrians. But it's also a way of ensuring that we uh, provide the healthcare to uh, populations that need it in the right way. Secondly, uh, the uh, economic aspect of uh, looking at uh, refugee and migrant uh, movements uh, across the region. Um, is there a particular negative impact on public health expenditures? The answer is no. The evidence that we have is no. The Inclusion of refugee and migrant health into national legislation from the very, very early stages of when people arrive in countries 
is the way to uh, eliminate the uh, negative expenditure that we may see in the health system. Refugees and migrants in general are healthy. Yes, there are big issues with mental health and we need to find a solution for that. But providing, for example, primary health care at the early stages will ensure that we cut the medical costs from the beginning because refugees and migrants have the same wishes as everyone else to remain healthy. And if we only provide emergency health care at the late stage, it's much more expensive in the long run. Yes, good, thank you. I will ask there in the room. I saw there was another question. Sir? Yes. Uh, can I ask you, because we just have a few minutes left be, before the break, so can I ask you to make short. short questions yes. and short replies? <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, I'm uh, Walter Arasola Tiolianti, Medical Director of the Belgian Lung and Tuberculosis Association. And um, to go further on the slide of um, Dr. Betun, I'm looking for a research group or research people who work on um, the health impact of racism. Racism very prevalent in Europe, very prevalent in Brussels, in, in Belgium. And it's a very strong social determinant of health. I'm trying to set up a research group, so if people are interested here, or from you, if you know any uh, people working on it, please let me know. Maybe we can uh, give them a microphone to Anyone has a, a short no, we question? We can transfer after that. Yes? A uh, wait, question. there's a question for you. A short question to uh, Mr. De Vitrin. Have you asked your people how much money they invested or their family invested in their travel and if they felt that that was worth the investment? Uh, no, we didn't do that. Uh, that would be a very, very interesting question to do, but that would be a survey in itself. Um, I think it's, uh, it would require uh, a, length, a more lengthy survey than the one we did, um, because, of course, that's a very touchy issue, and people don't want to tell that they have 3,000 euros worth of money available to pay their crossing across the desert. Um, so it would be a very difficult thing to do, um, but it evidently it is a very important question. And we know it's several thousands of euros to do the trip. Mm -hmm. Ms. Olivetin, since you have the microphone, I just have one question for you. Uh, I know that you don't want to talk about it, but personally I find it very interesting that today Mr. Olivetin is going to retire and he had his... Uh, last five years um, at uh, Médecins du Monde. And so my question is about the fact that you have been taking care of uh, Médecins du Monde for five years. Now you leave the organization. You leave the organization uh, thinking that everything is going to be okay and that everything is over, underway. Or do you think that there are still many, many things to do, especially here in Belgium for migrants and refugees? I thank you for not having yeah, uh, sure. My, my, uh, my pleasure. Question, whatever. <laughs> um, when you asked your question about the differences between the East and the West of Europe, I thought the main difference will be in time. It will not be in geography, it will be in time. We're, have, we're facing a change of society. And, and this, what we can see, the results of elections, the growing uh, rise of racism or of other forms of exclusion is not only rising in the East or in the West, it's rising everywhere. And it's not, in, it's not only rising in Europe, it's, only, it's also rising in the Americas, North and South, it's, it's rising in, in Asia. Look at the, the, the leading party in, in India for the moment, it's a radical party. Um, we, we should be much more aware, and so of course, Médecins du Monde has not finished its job. Yeah. Huh? No, of and course not. not with my no, but I mean yeah. also in terms of policy, what do you need? That was the question. The, 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 the challenges are increasing. Um, we need more money from the EU. Uh -huh. We need more help from the WHO. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Um, I think we need to make these consortia uh, of, of NGOs and UN and uh, policy makers uh, 
and, and we need to make them strongly. And, and of course, it's going to become more difficult uh, along the road. Um, the role of NGOs in there should be to be in the field and to do the thing and to be the voice, as I, as I, as I have tried to do today, to be the voice of the people who are suffering the consequences of our policies. That's what I think we should do, um, but it's a tough job and it's becoming more and more difficult because violence is on the rise everywhere we will. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I invite you to uh, join uh, the marble room, which is upstairs, uh, for a short coffee break. Thank you very much.